Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Nunley Math. We are talking about probability. This is the second video in our series. Yesterday, or previously, we talked about uh, the basic definition of probability and looked at some simple probabilities. And we're going to review that just very, very quickly today. And then today, we're going to talk about probabilities for outcomes that are not equally likely. And this is a little more involved than simple probability, so you're going to want to watch closely. Make sure you're making some notes to yourselves. Keep an eye uh, on, on exactly what's going on and how we're organizing our thoughts. So, when we talked about probability in the previous video, we said it's defined as the ratio that compares the number of desired or positive outcomes to the total number of equally likely outcomes. And we said that can be written as a ratio. We also talked about the fact that desired does not necessarily mean it's a good thing. It just means what we're desiring to examine or look at. Likewise, positive does not necessarily mean good or bad. It just means we're getting the result that we are investigating. And then we talked about dice. And we said the probability of a five on a die was one out of six because there's one five out of the six possible choices. And we did a, uh, several different examples on that. If you want to go into these in more detail, you'll want to go back and watch the previous video in this series. I'm not going to get into that too much today. The second thing we did is we reminded ourselves that probability or theoretical probability deals with what happens over a long period of time, not necessarily what happens every time. I can't predict what a die will do if I roll it once, but I can predict what should happen if I roll it 10,000 times or 20,000 times or 30,000 times. And in that way, we use probability to make predictions about the future and make decisions about um, what is going to happen. It always ranges from 0 to 100, with 0% possibility being things that cannot happen, 100% being things that must happen, and 50% probability meaning that it's equally likely to happen or not. But the problem we run into today is this. All of these things we've talked about only apply for events that are equally likely. But if I'm asked a problem like this, what is the probability of rolling two dice and having their sum be eight? This is a different problem because when I roll two dice, the probabilities have now changed. In fact, it's not as though I can just roll one die and say it's one time out of every six I'm going to get something. But now you have all these different combinations of numbers that can occur, like a three and a five, or a two and a, and, and a four, and a three and a three. There's lots of different things that can occur. And we may or may not be able to just think in our mind about what the result will be and about how many different things can possibly occur. When that happens, it's very important that you take the time to create some kind of a list or a diagram for yourself so you can see what the different possibilities are. And I'm going to spend some time in this video looking at three or four different ways that you can organize your thoughts when you have probabilities that are a little harder to see. Method number one, you could make an organized list. So in this problem, I'm talking about what happens when I have two dice. So I want to think about what the possibilities are. So when I set up my organized list, I might start off by saying, well, I could have the first die be a one and the second die also be a one. And I would write that down. Or the first die could be a one and the second die could be a two. Or the first die could be a one and the second die could be a three. 1 and 4, 1 and 5, 1 and 6, and so on. Now, what I want to point out to you is for the sake of my video, it did write out the words 1 because I thought it just looked a little nicer than listing the numbers. If I were doing this in a classroom setting or for my own benefit, I'd probably would just write out the number 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3 um, to make it a little faster. But I think it looks nicer in my slides and in the video for you if I write those out in words. Plus, I have the benefit of being able to cut and paste rather than having to write everything out by hand. Notice what I've done is I've kept the first die the same the entire time so I can look at all the possibilities that occur with the second die. But this is not every possible outcome because this only looks at what happens if the first die is a one and I come up with six different possibilities. But I could also have the first die be a two and the second die be a 1, or 2, 2, 2, 3, 2, 4, 2, 5, 2, 6. Notice I've got the exact same list, 
But now I've changed the first die into a 2. And I can repeat that with the first die being a 3, and the first die being a 4, and the first die being a 5, and the first die being a 6. The reason I do this is by listing every possibility where the first die is always the same. I make sure that I'm not accidentally skipping over anything. It's very easy if I start to start listing random numbers in an unorganized way to duplicate something or to leave it out. But here I've listed all the possibilities when it's a 1, and I know all the possibilities for the second die just keep getting duplicated over and over again. This is an organized list. It is very time consuming. It's not much fun to make. But again, I have the benefit of being able to cut and paste here. You have the benefit of being able to just write them out in numbers at home instead of writing them out in words. Notice the question is, what is the probability of rolling two dice and having the sum be eight? Well, I need to go through here and look for possibilities that give me a sum of 8. Remember, sum means add. 1 plus 1 is 2, 1 plus 2 is 3. I need to go through and add all these together and see which ones give me an 8. Here's one for you. 2 and 6. Here's another. 3 and 5. 4 and 4. 5 and 3. And 6 and 2. There are five different ways for me to get an 8. And if I were to count up all the different solutions. There are six, 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 six. There are 36 different possibilities all together. That means that my probability of getting a eight is going to be five out of 36, which is 0.1389 or 13.89%. In my class, we would probably go ahead and round that off to 13.9%. Please don't round it off to 13 or 14. We always want to include at least one decimal because that, that's an indication to people that it is a rounded solution. Does that make sense? Hopefully so. Um, I, I do think it is interesting that when I create my organized list, a lot of times you're going to see different patterns like lines of things that all fit together nicely and neatly or alternating. It, it's really fun to look for um, different visual patterns that occur when you do organize lists. Now, this is a tedious and time-consuming proposition. It is not the only way that you can make this list. Some people get frustrated because they keep having to write the same thing over and over again. There are some other methods we can use that may not be as um, as easy to to see or write, but they do allow us to um, maybe do it with a little bit less work. Let's look at a couple of those. I could ask this exact same question and use a tree diagram or a counting tree to help me um, in organizing my thoughts. The counting tree goes like this. We're going to have a starting point and then we're going to make a decision. The first decision is what occurs on die one. And I'm going to list those out by drawing lines from my start. I could get a one, I could get a two, I could get a three, a four, a five, or a six. Each of those arrows represents one possibility. Once I've made that first decision, let's say I've rolled my die and the first die is a one. When I've rolled that first die, I then have a second decision to make, and that is what happens on die two. Well, what happened on die one has no effect on what happens on die two. Die two could be anything from one to six. So I draw arrows off of die one to die two. And then I repeat that down here. If die one was a two, die two could be any of those six things. If die 1 was a 3, the second die could be any of them, and I continue that down for all my choices. And then I just go through and add them up. 1 plus 1 makes 2. 1 plus 2 makes 3. 1 plus 3 makes 4. And I can go through and do that for every item in my tree. And now I can look through and see those 8s pretty quickly. The probability of getting a sum of 8 is 5 out of the 6, 12, 18, 24, 30, 8 out of the 5 out of the 36 choices, which again is still going to be 13.89% or 
The benefit of doing it this way is I didn't have to keep writing 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, 1, 5, once over and over again. I only had to write the 1 once, and then all the choices came after that. It's not terribly helpful to do it this way if you've got something short like just a single digit number, but if I were writing out my decisions in words, um, which is sometimes necessary, then you're going to find you'll save a lot of time by not having to write this word over and over again. A couple things I do need to point out. One common mistake that students tend to make is they tend to go from the start and they tend to say die one or die two as their decisions. Remember, you're not choosing between die one or die two. You have to do die one and then you have to do die two. So make sure you know the difference between decisions and options. Your decisions go across the top. Decision one, decision two. Your choices are where you split into arrows. Does that make sense? Here's a third method for working with problems like this. What is the probability of having two dice and having their product be even? Notice here I'm talking about products. That means we're going to be multiplying the two dice. Now, I could list the options in an organized list like we did in the first slide. I could put the options into a counting tree or um, tree diagram like we did in the second. I'm actually going to use a third option called a Punnett square or an area model. A Punnett square or an area model. And it goes like this. If I have two dice, I can put the options for one die across the top and the second die up and down. So this is one die, this is the second die. And then when I look at the boxes where they overlap, die one, die two, both have ones, I can put their product here in the middle. So if one die has a two and the other has a one, let's say uh, this one's one and this one's two, I get a two. If I have a 1 and a 3, if I have a 1 and a 4, 1 and a 5, 1 and 6, if the first die is a 2, that's this one here, this column, 2 times the second die is a 1, 2 times 2 if the second die is a 2, and I can go through and I can list all the products out in my area model or my Punnett square. Now I can see all the different possibilities. Notice there are 36 different options here, 36 different things that could occur given a six-sided die and a six-sided die. I'm looking for the probability of rolling two dice and having their product be even. So I'm going to go through here and look for all the even numbers, the even numbers. Well, one times two is a two, four times one or one times four is a four, six, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 6, 12, and 18, and I can go through and circle all of them, and I can count them up. When you count them up, you should realize that there are 27 even numbers out of 36 possibilities, or in simplest form, that's 3 fourths. I would require my students to give the answer 3 fourths. Then as a decimal, that should be 0.75, and then as a percent. You can see I went back and made an edit and I missed it right there. So 0.75 or 75 percent. Um, conversely, we could say the product of, an, of uh, is odd would have a probability of 9 out of 36. There are 9 that are not circled out of 36 total. That's 1 fourth, 0.25 and 25 percent. Now, I do find this to be really interesting. Most people are surprised by this because they think that the evens and the odds should be the same. But keep in mind that if you ever have a even number times anything, it always comes out as an even number. Circle those. But if I have an odd times an even, it's going to come out as an even. The only time you get an odd product is if you have an odd times an odd. So 75% of the time, it's going to be even. 50% would be when it's the evens times anything, 25% more for the odds, or I should say half the odds are also going to give you even results because when you have an odd times an even. 
I like this particular problem because notice that the evens plus the odds equal 100%. That's 3 fourths plus 1 fourths equals 4 fourths. 25% plus 75% equals 1. Notice I have those switched. That needs to be fixed. 7 and 2. And down here, 75% plus 25% equals 100%. These are mutually exclusive events, meaning every number that's in our list is going to have to come out as even or odd, and there are no situations where you have a number that is both. I actually really like the area model. Um, it does have some limitations and some drawbacks, but it does give us some really cool, um, some really cool things we can look at, some, some really cool patterns that you can see along the way visually. What's the probability of rolling an even number on a six-sided number cube and drawing the queen of clubs from the hand at the right? Now, whenever I give you a problem that says from the hand, we're just talking about what's right here. We're not talking about the probability of getting a queen of clubs from an entire deck of cards. That's confusing for students sometimes. I do this so that students who don't remember how many cards are in each suit and how many cards are in a deck still have a, um, a good chance of getting the problem correctly if they understand the probabilities. What I'd like you to do is pause the video, see if you can create an area model for this problem. Remember, there's two events. One thing or one side of your area model is going to be the six choices on the number cube. The other is going to be the hand that's shown. I'm going to assume that if you wanted to do that, you've already done that, and I'm going to start working it out here. Notice, I chose to do the die up and down, and I chose to do the hand across the top. It really didn't matter which one you put where. That's just the way I chose to do it. Probably shouldn't use the heading dice because one of them is a die, the other is a hand. I should probably black that out. I think I'll do that uh, before I give this to my students. Once you've got that, you can sit and list your choices. Now, notice it's not the probability of the sum, and it's not the probability of the product. It's just what's the probability of getting um, an even and also. So what I'm going to do is in these boxes, I'm just going to list both choices. Notice decision one is the die. Decision two is the card. I could get a one on the die and draw the three, a two on the die and draw a three, a three on the die and draw a three. I could get any number on the die and still draw a 3. I could get any number on the die and draw that 6 of hearts right there. I could get any number on the die and draw the 6 of spades. I could get any number on the die and match it to the jack of spades, the 10 of diamonds, or the queen of clubs. The only outcomes that we would consider to be positive or, or successful outcomes are the outcomes where we get both an even number, well, I can't draw this, an even number and the queen of clubs. For example, the two and the queen, or the four and the queen, or the six and the queen. Those are the only two opportunities there are for us to have both those events occur together. So the probability of an even and a queen is three of our 36 options, which I would require my students to write as 1 12th, which is 0.083 repeating, or 8.3%. You could, if you chose, uh, write this with a repeating bar over the 3 as well. Here's one more for you. What is the probability of spinning a red on both spinners at the right? Show this with both an area model and a tree diagram. In my class, make sure you read the directions carefully so you know what I'm asking you to do. There are shortcut methods for calculating the probability without showing the diagram. We'll talk about that in a future video. But in this problem, in order to receive credit, you have to show both. I would recommend pausing the video and trying to create both of those on your own. I'm going to assume that if you wanted to do that and are willing to do that, you've already done that, and I'm going to keep going. When I do my area model, notice that I have spinner 1 across the top. That's this three-section uh, spinner. And decision 2 is the four-section spinner up and down. You could have switched these. It doesn't matter. This is just how I elected to do it. Notice I've listed all the options. Notice that uh, I could get a red on both spinners. I could get a red on the uh, spinner 1 and a yellow on spinner 2, and I can go ahead and fill those in. Notice there's one way to get a red and a red. 
which means the probability is 1 out of 12. And there it is as a decimal to percent. If I wanted to do this as a tree diagram, a tree diagram, I would have a starting value or starting location, and then I would make my first decision. My first decision is spinner 1. Notice I'm not choosing spinner 1 or spinner 2. I have to do them both. So my first spinner, I have four possible outcomes. If I spin red on the first spinner, it does not affect what happens on the second spinner. So it could be red, yellow, blue, or green. Notice the yellow doesn't show up real well. Sorry about that. I didn't pick the spinner. I just copied and pasted it. If I get an orange on the first spinner, I could still get any of those on the second. If I got a purple on the first spinner, I could still get any of those on the second. Where do I have red, red? If I list my choices, you can see there's only one red red out of all the possibilities. Last one. In the space below, draw a tree diagram showing all the events that can occur when flipping four coins. Now this is important because there are four decisions being made. Four decisions being made. Four decisions being made. You have to decide what the first coin is going to be, what the second coin is going to be, what the third coin is going to be, and the, what the fourth coin is going to be. What's the probability of rolling four coins and getting at least three tails? Why would an area model not be a good way to represent this information? We'll answer that in a second. So let's start with the tree diagram. There are four decisions. There are four decisions. So make sure that when you set up your tree diagram, you're not choosing between da, uh, coin. Mm, let's try this again. Let's look at one more. In the space below, draw a tree diagram showing all the events that can occur when flipping four coins. What's the probability of rolling four coins and getting at least three tails? Why would an area model not be a good way to represent this information? Well, let's take this piece by piece. The first thing we got to do is draw a tree diagram where we're flipping four coins. That means we're making four decisions. So when you go to set this up, do not choose coin one or coin two or coin three or coin four. Instead, you need to have branches for coin one. After you finish coin one, then you branch off for coin two. I would suggest doing that on your own. I'm just going to pop the final result up here for you. So if you don't want to see it, pause real quick. And here's what I end up with. Notice, coin one, I had to choose between heads and tails. If I got a heads on the first coin, it did not affect what happens on the second coin. I could still get heads or tails. If I got tails on the first coin, the second coin could still be heads or tails. And then I branch again for the third coin and for the fourth. Notice I use the abbreviation H and T instead of writing out heads and tails. You may feel free to do that. Just make sure your handwriting is close enough or it is neat enough that you can read it. The question is, what's the probability of rolling of wow, rolling flipping four coins and getting at least three tails? Well, let's walk through and see. At least three tails. We got four out of sixteen. Take a look here. This one doesn't work. This one doesn't work. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. Oh, there it is in bold. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. And then these three are in bold. Notice at least means three or more. We have four out of 16 or one fourth or 25 percent. Now, if you're wondering why an area model would not work, Remember, an area model uses a rectangle, a rectangle, and puts one decision across the top and the other decision up and down. But this has four decisions, so the area model would not work. We actually do have methods uh, in, uh, where we could represent a three decision model using a three-dimensional figure, but four-dimensional figures, um, we really don't have a way to deal with things like that. So we have to go back and resort to one of our other methods like counting trees and organized lists. Hopefully that's been helpful for you. I'm going to go make sure I take some time and go back and edit some of these little errors uh, and typos along the way so it makes a little more sense for my class. I hope you've enjoyed watching this. As always, make sure that you um, 
smash that like button, make sure you ring that bell, turn on notifications, and certainly leave us a comment in the comment section if there's something we can do to improve or if there's something that was particularly helpful. You guys take care of yourselves. This has been a lot of fun. Bye-bye.